Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Adam Johnson, but please call me Adam. I'm a second year emergency medicine residency, and I'll be presenting Choosing a Medical Specialty, a look at emergency medicine. And uh, right now I'm calling in from sunny Bakersfield, California. It's about 4 p.m. over here, a beautiful day. And I know some of you guys are on the East Coast, West Coast. I wanna say thank you everyone for joining. And I have the honor also to introduce Gino Etta. Say hi, Gino. How you doing? And uh, we also have Dr. Pavel Antonov. Hey guys, thanks for joining. And um, let's see, I have a little background on myself. I grew up in Southern California, went to UCSB for undergrad, went to AUC and graduated December 2015, enjoyed every moment of it, and wanted to get back to California, and now I'm a second year resident here in, working in emergency medicine in Bakersfield, California. Um, Gino, you want to tell us briefly about yourself as well? Yep, yep. Uh, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I went to Wayne State University for undergrad. I went to AUC for medical school. I also enjoyed every minute of the ride and did most of my cores in new york and now i'm back home and i'm actually emergency medicine here in metro detroit pavel hey so uh i'm pavel antonov i grew up upstate new york went to undergrad there at um, state school at binghamton university went to med school at auc then uh graduated may 2016 matched emergency medicine down here in really hot Miami, Florida at Kendall Regional Medical Center. I'm a second year resident here now. And no, hopefully Excellent. we'll convince you this is the best specialty. <laughs> Absolutely. So moving right along today, we're going to discuss, uh, discuss the overview of emergency medicine. Uh, where do emergency medicine physicians work? What it takes to become one of these great EM physicians? What is it? Uh, what also goes into, you know, making a great physician? Residency outlook compensation, and some factors that go into choosing this great specialty. So overall, um, emergency medicine is this medical specialty dedicated to diagnosis and treatment. And a lot of times, patients coming through the ER, you don't really know what they have at first. They're going to have these unforeseen illnesses or injuries. And um, what really excites me about the specialty is that you have to be a great diagnostician. Um, you know, the, just the mystery of what someone has is, is really exciting. Um, and what this also includes is the evaluation, diagnosis, treatment, coordinating amongst multiple teams and providers, and also where are these patients eventually going to go? Are they going to go to a medical service? Do they need surgery or do you need a call psych? Um, that's something that really draws me to this field is that it's so diverse. You're working with so many different types of patients, depending on social economic status or uh, different walks of life, uh, very sick to uh, maybe a minor injury, families and patients. Uh, emergency medicine is actually a somewhat newer field that was created around the 1970s, really took off in the 80s, compared to some other specialties that have been around for hundreds of years. So what, where can you expect to work as an emergency medicine physician? And again, what I love about this specialty is that it's so diverse. You can work in a hospital. You can work in urgent cares. You can work in these small little emergency departments out in the middle of nowhere that are not really associated with big hospitals or universities. Um, you can also specialize and work in small connected units. You can also work in a um, emergency medical response. As you see the picture here, um, I know some people, friends of mine have actually worked in maybe concerts or big venues as kind of an emergency medicine physician and also big disasters. And, you know, I know how the country now is kind of revving up their services and disaster drills and disaster sites and emergency response. So also, what's the road it takes to be an emergency physician? And I get this question a lot. Sometimes it's hard to see kind of the, the end of the road and what it takes to get there. But typically, I think most of us that are listening to this webcast today, which I'm very honored to give and host, but most of us probably have our bachelor's degree already. If not, you want to start with that. Go to medical school and hopefully have a successful 
career there, and uh, we can definitely give some pointers on how to succeed in medical school at the end of this with some Q&A. You're going to join residency, and during residency, you'll actually be able to earn your medical license. So it's pretty exciting. Before you even graduate residency, you can kind of practice independently with your license. You're going to want to join an emergency medicine residency. Typically, they've been three years, but there's also some four-year programs out there. And um, of course, you want to do as well as possible in residency. But I think a lot of us feel the most pressure comes from medical school getting into residency. After residency, you're going to want to take your board exams and kind of do well in those so you can become a, quote, board certified emergency medicine physician. Although I do know some people that are able to practice without their, their certified boards. And then some people actually want to go off and do a fellowship and specialize even more. And uh, I know there's sports medicine fellowships, injury prevention, toxicology, and um, it goes on and on. Some, special, some people choose to specialize just so they can create more of a niche for themselves. And, you know, if, if you love school, why not? What are some of the, the traits and, you know, what does it take to be one of these great ER physicians? And I'm actually going to ask for Gino and Pavel's opinion at the end of this. But, um, you know, you're going to need a relatively higher IQ. But, you know, of course, what specialty doesn't? Um, you're also going to be need to be a team player. If you like interacting with others and working with teams, um, this is definitely a specialty for you since you're coordinating with the surgeon and the case manager, the psychiatrist, the medicine doctor. Um, maybe you might be teaching a medical student or even someone shadowing. So you're always interacting with people, and I, I found this very attractive. You also need to have relatively higher energy. You know, you may be going from an asthma patient to a patient that's choking to a patient with a sprained ankle to a patient that's having a heart attack. So you're kind of shifting gears quickly, but um, at the same time, it, you know, it's, it's exciting because you never know what to expect and you're, you're seeing a lot of different new patients. Uh, again, you're going to want to need to work well with others. And, um, you know, with all these different patients and changing environment, you know, some, you need to make, just be able to make decisions with a little bit amount of information and be able to kind of go back and forth, switching from thinking about one patient to the next patient. And it sounds overwhelming, but, you know, this is what we've been studying our whole careers for, making the diagnosis, you know, everything you've learned in the textbooks and seeing these new patients. And uh, to me, that, that energy just really drew me in. Um, Pablo, maybe you want to um, elaborate? Yeah, I mean, one thing I've, I guess, realized over, I guess, a little over a year and a half is being confident, but being humble. Um, you're going to know a lot of things. You're going to, you're going to see people with complaints um, going through all the different subspecialties, like Adam was saying, from cardiac complaints to renal complaints to musculoskeletal complaints. You know, you, you have confident abilities. At the same time, you have to realize you know, you're the expert in emergency management, emergency stabilization, these conditions. And, you know, there's a fine balance between being confident in your abilities and um, being humble, which I think is a big thing that I've learned during residency. And I think it's a very important quality to have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Gino, any qualities that you think are important for an emergency medicine physician? Yeah, I think what Pavel said was, was pretty, uh, pretty uh, important, you know, staying humble is huge throughout the whole process, um, especially with like a competitive specialty as this and with how many people you're dealing with. It also like, you know, plays into the team player part of things where, you know, the, hum the humbler you are, the more you're willing to learn from others and the less you take things personally and the better you can take feedback, I think the better emergency position you'll be. Right, uh, I completely agree. All right, moving along. So, what can you also expect going into um, this field? Uh, 
you know, they are, despite what you hear, they are increasing the physicians, which I, I think is fantastic. Um, there's definitely a great need for physicians and emergency medicine physicians um, in general. So here you can see on the graph, in the last four years, they've created four to 500 more positions. And um, there are more and more AUC students and IMGs acquiring these positions. So although it's competitive, it's not impossible. Uh, so this slide kind of describes, you know, how many programs are there? You know, so there's about 220, and I believe it's still still growing. Um, how many positions are offered? Here we have 2,278. These would be categorical positions. And how many get filled? You know, I'm surprised that it wasn't completely filled, but uh, so there's a couple open spots, but it, it gets pretty much feel, filled each time. Um, Paul Morigino, any uh, feedback or anything you've heard about the competitiveness or the spots for the, for the last, you know? You know, I mean, I, so I'm in, I'm in South Florida. When I started down here, there was one emergency medicine program at the time, which was DO. And since my program started, which was 2016, in the South Florida region, there's, I believe, at least five if not six new programs just emergency medicine alone so gme is expanding but at the same time emergency medicine is becoming more and more popular whether it's the excitement it's the lifestyle it's you know whatever people's draw to the field is you know it's obviously still attainable because we're matching a consistent amount of people each year but it is growing increasingly popular and competitive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Gino, any comment on the competitiveness or um, the popularity of emergency medicine? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, uh, <clears throat> like, as when I walked into this uh, cycle, I thought, like, maybe I was going to get one or two interviews. I was pretty surprised with how many interviews I did end up getting. And then I was also, like, very surprised to see how many students matched emergency medicine from AUC this year, which I think the number was, like, six or seven, which was higher than last year. So I think that there is a lot of... Um, there is a lot of like hype about the competitiveness and it is very competitive. But I think if you do get the appropriate auditions and you do show yourself well and people see how you work, you have a great chance of nailing this, uh, nailing a spot. Um, but obviously, you know, compared to the US, uh, it's a little bit harder. But now that these DO programs have opened up, I mean, a lot of my interviews were DO only programs last year and this year they opened up. So that was a big change for us. And, and it mm -hmm. works in our benefit 100%. Yeah, excellent. And um, oh, I just wanted to say to any students or any individuals watching, I got to say that it's fantastic you were able to join us today and you've already got your competitive foot in the ring. And um, so shout out to you guys. You're on top of your game. So you stay with it and take every opportunity AUC or anyone has to offer, especially joining these webinars. So moving along. Uh, so this is a slide on who we matched this year. So we've got three at Michigan, congrats to those guys. We've got two out in Wyckoff Heights Medical Center, New York. We've got one in upstate New York, and we've got one out in Mississippi. Um, seems like every cycle we, we match people and maybe one in California or we've got some in the Southeast and Northeast, so it fluctuates every year. Um, one thing I have found that some of the spots that have hired AUC or IMGs in the past, they are a little bit more open-minded to hiring more in the future. So um, those are always um, excellent places to apply to. However, uh, it, interesting enough, I got interviews at places that they didn't even ask where I went to school because some of the, maybe someone looked at my file and then gave me the interview and the person interviewing me didn't even ask what school I went to. So I, I thought that was fantastic that they looked at me just as what I was saying during that interview and not as much about my background. So I think so any of your dreams are, are obtainable. Uh, but I also want to ask uh, Pablo, any thoughts on maybe the interview process or, or locations? 
Yeah, I mean, the interview process was uh, interesting. I think, well, like you were saying, there are a lot of um, programs that do repeatedly interview students um, from from our school. But I do notice every year, every few years, we get our foot in the door into a, a new program. For example, I don't think I've seen SUNY Upstate in a while. And I know Wyckoff is a newer program. And as you know, saying uh, St. John um, Macomb has uh, recently transitioned. So it's always great to see us getting into our foot into new programs. And, you know, that keeps the door open for future residents. And the more places we are, the more potential future applicants have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, excellent, good response. Um, and uh, Gino, any uh, feedback on locations or people trying to get back to their hometowns, whether it's East Coast, West Coast? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> well, I think like Michigan uh, and New York are obviously like, always your most IMG friendly states. Um, St. John Macomb, Oakland was uh, only DO last year. And when I was speaking with them, uh, during interview process and stuff like they had mentioned to me that we're not really looking at do or md so i think what's happening is is the do special the do programs that are opening up are really opening up they have to take mds and it seems to be that it's more uh caribbean md than it is us md that's that, that that are being interviewed at these programs and they really looked at us with a fair and square eye i mean they only took eight students for residency and three of them were from the same school auc so I was like surprised to see that. So I do think that this is like shifting in our favor, like most definitely. And then New York, obviously, as well, SUNY Upstate. I remember Downstate being like well, one of the programs that takes EM. I never heard Upstate take. So this is all good signs. But once again, I'm sure a lot of these students auditioned well, worked hard, showed themselves, and then they kind of like alleviated that whole, they, they leveled the playing field for themselves, as they say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess overall the point is if you really want to get to a location, it is possible, but you're going to have to work your butt off. Yeah. Okay, so uh, next slide here. What can you expect for compensation? I mean, we're all in a little bit of school debt, so we're thinking about what kind of money we're going to be making when we graduate, although we went into this profession because we love healthcare and helping people. Um, EM physicians generally make, my experience, um, you know, location may always depict what you get, but I think averaged, oh, as you get, you know, into your career, you can make up to um, 340,000. Um, I know, like I said, again, location wise, it kind of fluctuates. Um, you living somewhere that is really popular, everyone wants to live there, you might make a little bit less. If you're working somewhere that's in great need, but maybe it's not the most desirable location. I've heard of some physicians making up to $500,000 a year. So um, it fluctuates, but I think you'll be right around 250,000, 350,000 mark, um, you know, which is not too bad. So, and uh, also if you're interested in emergency medicine, I feel like you will always have a job because there's always people out there that are getting sick or doing stupid things. Um, but we're always there to help. Um, Paul or Gino, any feedback on um, salary throughout your career? I mean, like, obviously, you're going to be a physician. You're going to make money. Um, emergency medicine is uh, kind of like this graph shows in the middle of the road. Um, I think it is very – one of the reasons it is it is popular is that that um, is, you know, that lifestyle, spe quote-unquote, specialty that people – do tend to call it, even though there is a lot of a lot of hard work. There's a lot of switching days and nights, and I think the compensation is fair. And like you're saying, you can go, you know, large metropolitan area, live in a very desirable area, and be around average, or you can go somewhere very rural and make a lot of money and knock out your school debt very very quickly. So, I mean, you're you know, you'll be a doctor, you'll be in an emergency medicine position, you'll make money, you'll pay back your debt. Mm -hmm. Um, Gino, any uh, any thoughts? I mean, I'm, I haven't started working yet, but it looks, yeah. pretty, it looks pretty to me. Yeah. And, um, you know, I do know that there are some programs and locations that offer loan forgiveness. Um, yes, definitely. Deals. So if you work in maybe an underserved community for a certain amount of time, they'll actually pay off a big chunk of your student loans. Um, so I know that's an excellent deal as well because, you know, we're all trying to get out of debt. But, um, you know, it'll happen one way or another. 
Um, now, what I also there's pluses and minuses to every specialty. One of the great things is that emergency medicine physicians feel like we get paid what we deserve. And um, although I'm a second year resident, uh, I looking at those numbers makes me feel good. But uh, I think this also reflects that sometimes our profession is very fulfilling. So um, you will have you have that to look forward to as well. Uh, what what are some things or reasons that um, individuals choose emergency medicine? Just going down the line here, um, some people feel that it, it fits their personality, kind of that high energy, teamwork, e excitement, and making the diagnosis. Um, the, the specialty content, so I guess some of the unique attributes to emergency medicine, you're getting to work with your hands, do some bedside procedures. You're working with all these different specialists, diverse population, and um, you know you can work night shifts, day shifts, and I guess that kind of plays into the, the work-life balance we see down at the 77.3. That um, you know I know my program sometimes will work four days a week, and you get three days off, and that, that's pretty cool. Um, some shifts maybe eight hours. Some are nine hours, uh, but I know some places maybe 12 hours. So you can kind of balance out your work and your lifestyle. I know some places you can work two weeks in a row and then get a full week off. So uh, it's variable. Um, but, you know, I kind of skipped over this role model influence. Um, with all the, the energy and different kind of um, illnesses that you'll see in the ER, you may have to act as a role model and maybe do some teaching, uh, whether it's a medical student, someone shadowing. Um, but also, since you're working on the front lines of emergency medicine and medicine in your community, you may have the opportunity to go out to um, schools or programs and talk about your work and how you can change things. And you really have an opportunity to make a, a big influence. Um, also, my future family plans. I think that, um, again, with the schedule, it's you can kind of um, schedule yourself around your family. You know, maybe you want to spend time with family during the day. Maybe you want to work at night. If, um, if something comes up, maybe a family emergency, you're, I feel like most of us were, were pretty easygoing and um, all work as a team, so you could switch your shift, you know, pretty easily. Um, I do know a lot of individuals that want to go into a fellowship, so there's a lot of options for for fellowships and kind of creating a niche for yourself. Um, as for income expectations, I guess you we kind of know what we're getting into for for income. Um, the specialty is competitive, however, it's very doable. And then down here at the bottom, length of residency, three to four years, not too bad. Um, I chose a four-year specialty, and I chose that because I didn't mind having that one extra year before having a, a, a long career, and I thought that might just make me that much better. However, with a three-year program, you're probably squeezing in four years into three years, and you'll be able to get out and practice sooner, which that kind of excites me as well. And then expectations of family and education debt. I, I guess for a family, just like any specialty, you're going to have to make sacrifices. And, uh, but in the end, I feel like it's worth it. And then uh, education debt, we're all going to be in pretty similar debt, but you know, work hard, get a good job, and you'll be able to pay that off. Uh, Pavel, anything specific on this side that you'd like to talk about or point on? Um, I think uh, I agree. Uh, with this with this chart in general I mean I think my personality fits with a lot of people that work um, in the emergency department I love everything that has to do with emergency medicine um, you know so the the things that are at the top of the graph were my big contributing factors as to what you how I ended up um, in emergency medicine and I agree education debt it's just something that we really really do think about but at the end of the day like I mentioned that's not something that we should really worry too much when making your specialty decision. 
because you will pay off your debt, but you do have to work in your specialty for the rest of your life. Which So I, I completely agree that the income expectations and education debt are in the middle and lower part when driving specialty choice. And uh, Gino, any thoughts or feedback? Yeah, I think like the personality fits like huge. I feel like that's why the slows are so important, which is like the standardized letter. So they want to see how you work in the department. So personality fits probably like the most indicative of, you know, your your ability to actually become an ER resident. But I actually ended up having a mentor as well. So role model influence was big for me. I had a I had a mentor that kind of guided me the whole way through. So I would I, I would suggest, you know, if you're really interested in it to to find somebody who's Who's, who's done it before and who can kind of guide you through it because there's a lot of tips and tricks to this that I feel like I would have never known without that mentor. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think we'll be actually concluding here. So I want to thank everyone for joining. However, we're not going to, um, and, and we're going to, we're not going to end completely. We're going to conclude with some question and, answers. Uh, but I just wanted to say real quick, uh, thank you, Pavel and Gino, for uh, going through the presentation with me. Uh, also, special shout outs to Gustavo and Jamie out there for helping set this up. And um, also, uh, Laura. Oh, let's see. Okay, so um, question and answer. Um, I wanted to ask if anyone has any specific questions that myself, Dr. Antonov and Dr. Etta um, can answer for you guys. Um, I think most of you have a, a kind of a box typing section on the right there if you want to type in a question and we can do our best to answer it. Um, I think um, a lot of us have had the same questions or may all have similar questions and um, you know we since we graduated uh, most recently, we can probably answer some of these common questions. Let's see here. How many are online? 24 people? Um, yeah, looks like we've got 24. So, and I'm just looking at some of our questions here. Uh, okay, so one of our first questions. What's highest on your list of frustrations whilst currently practicing emergency medicine? Examples, insurance, legislation. Pablo, do you want to take this? Oh, all right. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. You know, I think one of my biggest frustrations in the, is just kind of the world of uh, medicine. So my program, it's uh, based at a community hospital. Um, we have a bunch of residency programs here, but it is a community hospital, so you you get to see kind of more um, the more common practice setting. You know, not every place is an academic hospital; that's the minority. So this is the more common practice setting, and you know, there's a lot of um, you you see how medicine starts to get driven by numbers, um, metrics, and a lot of oversight is by people who have not gone through the same training as you. Now, that is not unique to emergency medicine at all. It's it's just the way medicine is. Um, so, you know, that can be uh, can be frustrating at times where someone who doesn't know what your day to day job is tries to dictate how fast and and how long you know you have to do certain things like place certain orders. But that is just you know, like any other job, there are rules and guidelines, and it is something that every physician has to adopt their practice towards. But, you know, it is one of the more frustrating parts of medicine in general. Mm -hmm. okay. um, another question here. Um, how important, important is it to have elective clerkships that reflect busy trauma centers on your transcript or letters from locations like that? Um, do you know any experience with this? Yeah. I think that it's it's actually a pretty, you know, the slows. So when you get a letter, a standardized letter of evaluation from, you know, one program or another, like I think some programs carry a lot more weight than other programs do. So if you can kind of get yourself like a, into a, like a level one or a level, like a nice trauma center with a pretty busy emergency department, that's, I mean, I, it doesn't have to be university based, but it, it just, you know, if they have a good educational reputation, 
it will make a difference than if you do an elective at a at an emergency department that has no residency program. So you okay. need to at least, at the very least, do an elective at you know at a program that has an emergency residency program there, because those yeah. letters are going to be looked at, I think, with a little bit more weight, from what I understand. Uh, I, I, if you don't mind, I like to like add to that. I completely completely um, agree with you. Rotating, you know, I wouldn't worry as much about whether it's level one trauma, level two trauma, level three, level four trauma, or not a trauma center. But like Gino said, the most important thing is that there is an emergency medicine residency there because with, like he was saying, we keep talking about these special, uh, these uh, standardized letters of evaluation. Um, most, if not all programs require one, if not two of these letters, which can only realistically be filled out by fa by faculty members of an emergency medicine program. So while it's great that you might be able to go to a place that has a trauma, you know, a trauma program, everything like that, but no residency, you know, it might not be looked as highly upon or you went to a program that just has a residency. So my, my hospital is a level one adult pediatric trauma center. Um, I think trauma is one of the, personally, one of the less important things when making a decision in an emergency medicine program. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. So like going somewhere where you can get exposed to residents and, you know, get the right kind of letters, that's more important. Yeah, that's that's huge. I think like the people who, who had who struggled with their interview, like who did not get as many interviews, they didn't do any uh, ER like rotations at residency programs. Mm. And it just it just didn't it didn't pan out as well. So I, I personally believe like my first the first place I did an elective at. Uh, they, they wrote me like a nice letter and, and whatnot, and I think that was a really big part of the reason I got as many interviews as I did, and it, it helped a lot. It really does help a lot if, if there's an – there, first of all, the residency program is somewhere for you to, you know, showcase yourself, so you're not wasting an opportunity, so you can – so first off, you're you're showcasing yourself to that program, so you might be able to go there, plus the, you know, the people who, who read the letter from that program, it'll, it'll carry more credibility, more weight. Yeah. Okay. Great responses. Um, I think those questions and answers are, are probably best for maybe the fourth year medical students, but I don't want to leave out the second and third years. Um, I remember, and I'm just going to summarize the question, uh, what is, um, what's a good step one cutoff score and what's kind of the difference and importance of step one versus step two scores? Um, Pavel, any thoughts on this? Um, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, uh, I do think U S assemblies are important, um, especially, you know, coming from the Caribbean, you know, you know, there, it's not, it's not a secret that there will be some bias when you're applying to some of the more, especially competitive specialties and some of the more competitive programs within any specialty in general. So in my opinion, you shouldn't give yourself any quote unquote red flags or even yellow flags when, when you're applying to residency. So I do think it's important to do well on step. Um, if you, to put a specific number on it, I mean, this is just like anecdotal. I mean, it seemed that people that were in the mid two thirties and above were getting more, um, were getting more interviews and it seemed that people in the mid two like thirties and below were seeming less interviews from a, coming from the Caribbean standpoint. Um, so, that's kind of my take on it. I do think it's really important. And if you're looking for a specific number, I'd be targeting at least the mid upper two thirties and above. Yeah. So I, I don't know if I can say there's a discrete cutoff, but yeah. I do agree. The higher your score, the more interviews. And I actually had a mentor tell me, don't pay attention to the cutoff score. You should be scoring as high as you possibly can exactly. and do whatever you can to get that high score to make sure you land into emergency medicine. Yeah, and that, that's um, just from, coming from the Caribbean. You just yeah. have to have the high score, the higher scores. It just, right. just has to, you know, and it's not just step one. I think step two as well. It needs to be exactly. Decent. Yeah, so that's just that's so, just to help yourself level level the field. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And um, but I guess step one compared to step two scores, I do know that, um, and I'm. Uh, after talking to a lot of people and reviewing this, especially at conferences and talking to other program directors, that a lot of people will look at step one. Um, when it comes to step two, um, sometimes they'll either look at maybe the higher of the two scores, um, or there are some students that haven't taken step two, surprisingly, by the time they're interviewing, so they may only have step one to fall back on. 
Um, so either way, I guess you want to score really high. However, you don't want to score high on step one and then score lower on step two. So, yeah. but they, I think it's better to score, you know, good or well on step one and then even better on step two. So if you do poorly on step one, you better do awesome on step two. So I guess either way, just do the best you can. You're going to have to make sacrifices, but I think at the end, it'll be worth it. I'd say at a minimum, like a 230 with like, like or, or more, you know? Like, yeah, that that's probably a safe bet. However, I, I know people that have gotten in with a 215, a 225. Yeah, it's kind um, of like a weird specialty like that because you'll go and you'll talk to them and they'll say, we don't care about step scores. But that's not right, necessarily right. Like pertaining to yeah. us. Um, it's one of those specialties that really, honestly, like, I mean, I was rotating with U.S. students that had 210s, 215s. But I think, like, to be – just, like, to kind of save yourself, you know, because like, they're going to ask you that quite – that's, like, the first question I get asked all the time. So, right. And yeah. um, and we do have to remember that we're at an international medical school that they may not be as familiar with. So you want to do your best to shine and stand out amongst um, every other student. Because it and is I competitive. Guess, yes, it, because it is. Yes, very competitive. Um, and I'm sure uh, Pablo and Gino can, Gino can agree that I feel like getting to this specialty, it's kind of like a, a big pie chart. If you do not as well in step one, you need to have good step two. You'd be better in these other parts of the pie. Uh, maybe some research. Maybe getting involved with um, student union at school. Uh, maybe having some other extracurricular activities. Maybe you don't have any research. Well, you better be better and have more stuff in the other categories, if that kind of makes sense. But um, let's see. Let's move on to one of our next questions. Um, why did we choose an international medical school? Pablo, do you want to start? Well, you know, so when I was an undergrad. Oh, and uh, sorry, and, and yeah. compared to maybe a U.S. school. What, why did you choose AUC, I guess, essentially? You know, I mean, it's no, no, no secret for me. You know, when I was an undergrad, um, I wasn't the best academic student. My focuses were on doing other stuff, which was mainly emergency medical services, which was pretty much how I got into emergency medicine in general. Um, one of my biggest problems was I didn't know how to study properly. So when it came time to take the MCAT, you know, I, I didn't know how to prepare. Um, so I applied, you know, to U.S. med schools, but ultimately didn't get in. And I didn't feel that waiting around um, was the right thing for me. And I had some friends that at, were students for, at AUC at the time, and, you know, everything was going well for them. So, you know, I thought I would give it a shot. And, you know, once I got to AUC, you have no other choice but then how to learn how to study. And, you know, that's how I ended up at AUC. And, I, you know, everyone at AUC has a very different reason and story as to how they got there, but that was mine. Excellent. Um, and Gino, did you feel prepared um, after you came out of AUC or or what were things that AUC did to prepare you? Uh, yeah, so like, you know, AUC to me stands for American University of the Comebacks. So mm. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I feel like obviously, I didn't even apply to any US schools myself. I just kind of went straight there, uh, went straight to the Caribbean. I just felt like I had a like better control of my fate, uh, you know, because I know if I worked hard, I would do well. I think AUC gave me everything I needed, like as far as resources, as far as opportunity. It was honestly they gave me everything I needed, especially like for the step one stuff. I mean, like I remember taking step one, re like reflecting on lectures. Like I had, we had good lectures. Um, of course, there's like the ups and downs. There's like you know, there's your instabilities here and there. But a lot of it really is like on you too. So you do have to like kind of walk in there knowing that, you know, <clears throat> this is on you. And <clears throat> like, if you just take that responsibility and you do the sink or swim mentality, yeah. that's just how I, I got through their sink or swim. I mean, life or yeah. death. It's just um, like, you know, you, you have to succeed. So, you know, I, I'm sure you guys remember um, very fondly, but I think one of the great things about AUC was when I was a first and second year on campus, we had one-on-one -on -one tutoring, um, yeah. so maybe you're taking anatomy, well, and, and uh, they, we, there is this whole one-on-one -on -one tutoring group association 
and you can sign up with a one-on-one, maybe anatomy tutor, maybe pharmacology tutor, maybe um, uh, you know any of these other classes, and you'd meet up for maybe an hour at lunch or an hour after class, and maybe you weren't doing as well in one class, you are meeting every single day leading up to the exam. Um, and I thought that was fantastic because uh, some classes I need extra help in, so I either was tutored, and then years down the line, I actually signed up to be a tutor myself. And so when I was tutoring pharmacology, that reinforced the pharmacology from my end. And I still remember some, I still use some of the information I use tutoring um, daily when I'm seeing patients. So um, I know the tutoring, one on one tutoring is really big. Also, I thought AUC had a fantastic open door policy of the professors that, again, if you're struggling in a class or just wanted clarification of a topic, you could go to their office, which they normally had the door open all the time. But of course, who wouldn't in 80 degree Caribbean? Um, they had the door open. And uh, I remember going to, uh, I can't remember her name, the immunology professor. Oh, Breaky Alley. Breaky Alley. I used to show up at her office every single day after class. Yeah. And I would just sit there with the textbook. And we, her and I would just go over and talk about immunology. And, um, but I remember I got a, a poor grade on one of my exams and I was pretty disappointed, but I went to her open door policy uh, sessions every single day. And uh, I think I got maybe a 99% on one of my exams. So I thought the professors are there to support you. Um, you know, you're in a, at an international school and everyone has left their friends and family behind. So everyone is there kind of like a new family to support each other. So I think there's a really good support system there. Yeah, I went, and, the, I went to the office hours. Like that was probably the biggest part of my success in the beginning. Was like going. I went to office hours every day, and mm -hmm. then like I got became a tutor as well. And then I had a peer to peer tutor, and the tutoring thing was huge because it kept you fresh. But the office hours was like invaluable. Mm -hmm. Um, and you so, know, you ask, you know, how how did they help you become successful? You know, this is not to brag at all, but you know, if I were applying, I'd want to know are the resources available for me to do well and succeed in the field? You know, I, I felt very prepared for the year assemblies. I scored very high on step one and step two. I passed all my exams on my first try. Um, I was able to match into emergency medicine. You know, the question I had was when I, when I started residency, you know, am I still going to be looked, you know, are there going to be any issues? Am I going to be looked down upon? Is there going to be a bias in my emergency medicine program? Um, we do have a few international graduates, but it's a mostly U.S. Um, it's a program full of mostly U.S. students, and you know the, it, it doesn't matter. No one asks you where you went to medical school. Um, no one asks what you scored on your CU assemblies. Um, as long as you do the work and you put in the effort, you know you'll get where you want to be. And you know I, I was chosen as one of the chief residents um, for my class. So wow, it, congrats! It, oh yeah, thanks. Um, but you know, you you can you can do it, and it does. You know, AUC will definitely help you get there. Sure. Um, you just have to work hard. I mean, there's like no getting exactly. around. It. Yeah, there's, there's, no, there's, there's just, no shortcuts. Just, you gotta exactly. work hard, and you, I mean. so I think another um, important thing we could probably dive deeper into um, any maybe extracurricular activities or activities through AUC, whether it's first year, second year, third year, fourth year. I guess overall, um, anything involved in the school or extracurricular activities. Um, were you guys involved in, in anything in school or extracurricular that, that would help you in this profession or get or help you to get into residency? Um, so when I was on campus, I was part of uh, Phi Chi, which was uh, it's a medical fraternity. It is a true, uh, you know, service community. Uh, organization. I mean, we did a lot of community service. We did a lot of uh, fundraisers. And, you know, it was a great way to make friends and meet upper semesters that would definitely help you with your uh, med school experience. And a lot of those connections carry on to clinical years and that, you know, translates to helping you get rotations and, you know, uh, tips and pearls as to go into residency. So I think that was one of the biggest things that helped me. Um, so I'll let Gino mm -hmm. add on. Yeah, Gina, were you involved in um, any school activities at AUC or even outside of AUC? Um, honestly, I really, really focused a lot on the tutoring. 
I did a lot of the big group tutoring and the peer-to-peer -peer tutoring. And then like when the community service day would come around, like I would do that as well. Um, but the tutoring I felt was, if, if that counts. I mean, I thought that was the most beneficial oh, yeah. as far as like yeah, what reflected on board scores and stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, let's see. I, I, I tutored tutoring. Um, you know, I think it's also important to not forget about your passions or your pastimes. Um, so residencies also want to see that, you know, you, you have hobbies, you're a normal person. Maybe you like to play guitar. Um, maybe, you know, myself, I was really into running and long distance running. Um, so although I, I did do a lot of stuff on campus, research, um, a little bit with student union, which looks good, but extracurricular. Um, when I was in New York, I was able to get involved with the New York Roadrunners, this running association, and I actually volunteered in the medical tent at the end of the race, um, kind of working as like a volunteer kind of paramedic EMT. Although I didn't, I didn't have any credentials. I just said, "Hey, I'm a medical student," and I was treating runners, so I was able to combine my love for running, and I got to you know actually sew up someone's head that had fallen during a rainy day race. Um, a lot of scraped knees. Uh, but you know, you're a medical student, so you know a lot more than most other people there. So I, I think if you can find something to combine maybe what um, your passions are and somehow involve medicine um, or just staying involved with something you're really into, then um, I think that that looks good as well. I know people did some volunteering on the island. I know there was like a diabetes clinic on the island. Um, I had some friends that were very involved in the student union at AUC, maybe first and second year. Um, and then I guess I would conclude this question, uh, not the Q&A, but just the question with um, I'm really involved in EMRA. Um, if you guys are you know, really into a, emergency medicine, EMRA is the Emergency Medicine Residents Association. And uh, medical students are involved in that in, in, as well. That's, this is kind of like the, um, the residence association amongst the you know, ASAP American College of Emergency Physicians. This is one of the biggest emergency physician groups in the country. Um, so I got involved in that my third, fourth year of medical school. And they have a lot of great resources, mentors. And I guess something I wish I had known when I was a student was going to some of these conferences and getting involved early because um, you can make a lot of connections through these conferences, a lot of connections through this organization. And um, so now I'm actually our program's representative. So that's something that I got involved in early if you guys are looking for something else to get more involved in. Um, again, that's EMRA and as well as ASAP. And I can give you guys more information on that later if you want. And a quick so, quick side note: If you uh, oh, do yes. sign up as a medical student, you get a lot of uh, cool free stuff from them. <laughs> um, so, but I still use. Cool, uh, speaking of cool stuff, um, there is a question: Any good books or short books to help with res the residency process for those specifically matching in emergency medicine? Um, Pavel, Gino, any thoughts? Um, honestly, I didn't read any any books in particular. Um, a lot of what I <laughs> Did you know and take it all with a grain of salt? Was I read a lot of forums online? Um, I went through the NRMP website. I went to um, a student doctor network, which you know can be like its own dangerous area. But you know, there's a lot of useful information online. There are a lot of people that have been in your shoes before and that like to write about it. So I found those. I found that to be the most helpful. Mm -hmm. I know one of my personal favorites was. The Medical Student Survival Guide, yeah. which uh, I'm sure you can look up maybe a PDF or on Amazon. I think it's also offered at the, the, um, the EMRA website, but uh, Medical Student Survival Guide. I, I think it's Emergency Medicine Resident or Student Survival Guide. Um, Gino, did you have any specific resources you used? Yeah, for emergency. Um, I didn't read this before, but I read it like later on. It was that three-minute ER presentation. Mm -hmm. That was a really good one. Oh, just yeah, like that was a really good one thing. for EM specific. Yeah. Um, Other I than that, see... I just kind of like learned as I went. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, these are all great questions, great questions. Um, okay, so another question, uh, this is very common. 
Did you apply to a backup specialty? If so, how did you split your rank list between the two specialties? Hmm. I did. Um, okay. So, what, do you want to elaborate? Yeah. So <laughs> I applied like I like I applied to a lot of EM and then a lot of IM as well. Um, I actually got asked in an interview. They they asked me like, "What are you going to do if you don't match EM?" And I said, "Well, I guess I'll just do IM." And then the guy started laughing, but. Um, <laughs> People think like the backup specialty is like frowned upon, but for us it makes sense um, based on how competitive the specialty is. But I just ranked all my ER first, and then all my IM after that. So I pretty much just had yeah. like my six, seven ER, and then I had like ten IM after that. So I went on a lot of interviews, but I mean security is how I like it. Just it just helps you sleep at night to know that well, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I agree. I think. Um, that the anything goal is that. You do, even as a physician, you need to have a backup plan. Um, you know, what if you're doing a procedure, something goes wrong, or what if you're doing a project, you need to have a backup. So yeah, I think applying to emergency medicine, uh, you know, sure, apply to internal medicine as a backup. I'd rather be safe than sorry. Um, Pablo, yeah. any, any thoughts um, on this? So I actually, um, I I did apply for a backup. Same way with you know, I applied internal medicine as a backup because. I just didn't know 100% what to expect when it was coming for interviews. Um, I didn't want to do internal medicine that badly. It's just, but it was a alternate pathway to getting into something critical care. So I thought worst case scenario, I can make do with it. Um, mm -hmm. Personally, I, if I had to redo it, um, I would probably still apply for a backup specialty just because the fear of the the fear of the unknown. Um, I ended up getting more than enough emergency medicine interviews, but a lot of my interviews came December, January, late November, which is would have made me really, really nervous. So internal medicine was almost kind of like a nice buffer that was like, okay, something is going to happen. Yeah, and, and it's going to be okay. Yeah, because you know if you have the decent board scores, you know you don't want to throw away like a guarantee match. Yeah, because yeah, exactly. internal medicine is not as I mean, you, you just have to apply the pack. I think the goal is to match. If you yeah. Know, if you want to be a doctor mainly. Yeah. Okay. So we've got about eight minutes left here. So we'll wrap things up with a couple more good questions. Um, and some of these may be a little bit more specific. Uh, this next question is, how, um, let's see here. Um, how willing are the AUC affiliated sites to write slowies? Pavel? Um, okay. So I was a September class. Uh, as a September class, your schedule gets a little tight in terms of electives. I was able to do two EM electives. They just happened to be at the same site, which is not ideal, but it obviously worked out. Um, I mean, any place that has an emergency medicine program, um, they want obviously more residents to come. They're, they're used to doing this. I really didn't have any issues and, um, and asking for them, but like everything else, you have to be your own advocate. You can't just expect that they're going to write it for you. You can't just expect that you ask them one time and it's going to be ready the next day. So, you know, balance of persistence and patience. Um, mm -hmm. But, I mean, you do the work, the letter will be there, and it definitely helps us match. And, you know, I guess I should have prefaced this question with uh, this slow way that we speak about stands for is SLOE, Standardized Letter of Evaluation. And these are now required specifically just for the field of emergency medicine, where normally when you do a rotation, um, it's just a way of a, having a standardized letter of rec that um, normally program directors or attendees can fill out for you just so we have kind of a standardized evaluation, um, kind of specific to our specialty. Normally you need about one to two of these. However, I do know of some students that did, I mean, up to five odd, odd quote audition rotations and they, they obtained five slowies. Most of the time when you do one of these audition rotations, you have a much higher likelihood of getting an interview at that location. Um, so, but, you know, correlation doesn't always equal causation or vice versa. Um, Gino, any thoughts on, or in, input on these slows or standardized letters of evaluation? Yeah. Um, so as far as, you know, like AUC sites uh, for emergency medicine and like, you know, AUC being the, so AUC is not going to be the person who gives you the slow. Like you kind of have to take initiative here. 
Yeah, like we all kind of like everybody that I know, like we all went to, you know, we all did a, like we all did electives at programs that even weren't affiliated and that programs that were affiliated. So we have like a mix of both. But the slow is really on you. I think the biggest thing that my best advice to you is the timing of your slow. Like I had to think about like, you know, did I want to get, you know, did I want to take step two a little bit later and then, you know, have a slow in on time. It was more important to have the, the like, you know, the couple of standardized letters of evaluation in by the time applications open. So like, I feel like if you're, you really want to do this, you really want to try and get those letters in early. Like, so when you're applying, they're already there. Mm -hmm that's the i think that was the best thing that i could have done you know mm -hmm. like my step two ended up coming like a week later but that didn't matter um right. as much as just having those letters of evaluation because a lot of these programs do have like a like a filter of sorts where i mean if you don't have any of them or you only have one i mean if you have one it's better than none but you can have two by the time applications get submitted like you're in really good shape mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i had two from the same program when i submitted so oh, i had wow, one from the nice. department and i had one from an attending and then I got a yeah. third one like in October. Same. Oh. I, I only applied with two from the same program. Just that's how my schedule. Yeah, was. There was like nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, and this is kind of, this next question uh, topic is kind of a fourth year um, student question with our last four minutes. Um, Gino and Pablo, how, where did you guys, how did you choose where to rotate? Um, I chose, honestly, I chose based on availability and I chose based on, uh, where previous students told me was, you know, the best place to go to get a good rotation and to get a slow. Uh, for me, it was Brooklyn Hospital Center. Um, for me, I'm from the Northeast, so that was convenient for me. Uh, Brooklyn Hospital Center was known for writing uh, slows for us. They were known for taking IMGs. They're also known for taking a few of our graduates as well. So to me, that made the most sense. Um, and I'm sure other rotation sites made more, more sense for the people that went there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess. Was, uh, I agree with Pavel on that one. Okay, go, go ahead. Anything, anything more on that, Gino? Um, yeah, so I just, I did one. I went to a place that was IMG, for, like that was known to take IMGs. Um, they, you know, they wrote the slows on time. But um, I also had like a mentor, like they kind of like guiding me too. But then you really don't, like, you, you, you want to talk to the previous people who have matched. So like now that I, for instance, like this program that I matched into is open, I would I would assume you know it would be like an option for people. So it's like it's kind of like evolving as well. So you want to keep up with the new programs that are that went from DO only to like now accepting MDs. Mm -hmm. you, can, you call them like you have a really good shot at getting a lot of Definitely. getting an elective in there as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess overall location, um, changing programs. Um, availability and um, I mean you, sometimes you're gonna have to hunt for that program that'll take you but um, you know you just gotta find a program that's that's right for you so I guess we can conclude with one last question um, and I, I, I like this question because it makes me think about back when I was a medical student um, what factors make you shine in a in an elective when you're rotating through the ER um, Pavel, what what uh, factors or traits made you really shine? Um, so I guess I can I can kind of give that from the uh, well, funny I can give that from the from the view of a resident because um, we we have medical students from a few med schools rotate with us and the medical students that stand out to me are the ones that seem interested. Um, you know, a nice balance of eagerness, um, but not you know over eagerness and ones that come in with some sort of base knowledge you know we don't expect medical students fourth year medical students to come in functioning like an intern but you know we do expect you to want to learn and get better progression just like a progression in medical school progression in residency is one of the most important things and it's one of the things that i like to see in medical students and i know our faculty like to see in medical students so just the willingness to learn you know not sitting there on your cell phone for the shift in between patients you know being active, um, how ask the nurses if you can do any if they can teach you something. Their wealth of knowledge, you know. I think the big thing is just stay active and stay eager. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Gino, any any traits that you think really made you shine? Um, yeah. So th this one guy was like, who gave me advice. He said, "Be seen but not heard." So yeah, that, yep. was, like a, mm -hmm. that was like a big one. It takes time to learn that. 
Yeah, but absolutely. Like, that's like, Definitely. you know, you don't want to, like, you know, it's like we are high energy, so you need to find the balance. Um, like we're extroverted, so you need to find the balance. But at the same time, like, you know, that ancillary staff, the nurses, the techs, those are the people that are going to help you. So you really want to start with them and then kind of work your way up. That's how I would yeah. do it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, great, great responses. And, you know, when I was a student, um, I rotated through Kern Medical in the ER and um, I really enjoyed it. And I've, you know, tried so many hard, tried hard in so many different areas of um, whether it was showing up early or medical knowledge base. Um, but when I eventually got the residency position, one of the upper resident, one of the senior residents, he said, Adam, we chose you because you're teachable. So I, I remember specifically one time I, I kept reading up on procedures, hoping for one day to be able to do a procedure. And I was allowed to do a central line and they just walked me through it one time. And then I was able to perform it in front of them. And, you know, now here I am a couple of years later, I'm teaching it to other medical students and, and interns. So amongst all these other great traits, I think being teachable, being able to learn something, knowing what can go wrong with it, um, being prepared and, um, you know, being able to execute your using your knowledge and, and skills and being able to learn. Well, um, that was a great question to conclude with. Um, any last remarks, um, Pavel? Um, you know, if we're talking specifically about um, emergency medicine and going to AEC, it's obviously something that's very attainable where year after year success. Um, we obviously all think this is the best field and the best specialty to get into. And, you know, the simple thing is to work hard. The hard part is to actually do it. Um, so, I mean, if you guys ever have questions, I'm sure you guys can get our contact info, send us an email. Um, we'll definitely be able to help out. Mm -hmm. Uh, any last words, Gino? Yeah, so you, you kind of like touched on the coachability. Taking feedback is so important with this specialty. And I think that, you know, for every 10 people that I'd ask for feedback, maybe one person would give me a true feedback. So the feedback is huge so you can grow. And you can't really grow unless you're kind of like paying attention to the things that you can work on and fix. So to be yeah. coachable, you have to be able to take feedback like a champion and like ask yeah. for that feedback like aggressively. People might give it to you, people might not, but there will always be that one resident who kind of just tells you exactly what it is you need to work on. And then that'll just be something that you take with you for, till the, you know, as you move on through your next elective and your next rotations and your interviews as well. So just constantly keep that in mind, I think is yeah. big. Absolutely, great, great last point. Well, I want to um, thank Pavel Antonov and Gino Etta for um, being panelists on this webinar today. Again, I'm um, Dr. Adam Johnson, second year resident, but please just call me Adam. Um, we went a couple minutes over, but there's a lot of great juicy info here today. Um, so I'm honored to have hosted this and thank you for AUC and um, everyone for putting this together. Hopefully we can do more of these in the future. Any other specific questions, feel free to um, get our information and um, we're always more than willing to share information we want as many of you to do as well as possible and to achieve your green, achieve your dreams. So um, and just don't forget, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>